I'll talk of the water session. <laughs> Functional encryption for regular languages by Brent Waters. Oh, th thanks, Juan. Okay, so um, I'm Brent Waters, and I'm going to be talking about functional encryption for regular languages. And to start, uh, in this session, we have been talking about uh, functional encryption. And this is a new way of uh, thinking how we share data. In the past, it was usually that, let's say, uh, Bob wanted to say a uh, send a particular message to a particular user, Alice, and no one else should see it. And now we have a situation where, let's say, Bob will have some data X that he will embed in the ciphertext somehow. Um, Alice is, uh, in general, will have a um, private key associated with some value Y. And for functionality um, F, uh, she should only learn F of X, Y. So uh, let's see here. If we're to animate this, the authority will give Alice the secret key for Y. Bob will somehow encrypt using the public parameters in X. And now later on, if Alice is able to get a hold of the secret key, she's able to learn F of X, Y. Um, I won't get into deeply into the security definitions here, but intuitively we want the property that she should only learn. Uh, the function f of xy. Okay, so let me start by um, talking about a um, common or you know, perhaps popular form of uh, functional encryption called key policy um, ABE, or attribute-based encryption. Um, here, uh, a, a key is going to be associated with a Boolean formula, or it could actually be a circuit for the purposes of this talk. And uh, the ciphertext will be a pair of a hidden message and a set of assignments to variables, let's say to n variables um, 0, 1 through n, and the functionality that we want is if um, this assignment satisfies the Boolean formula, you can decrypt and you will be able to see the message. And if not, um, you, won't, you won't learn anything about the message itself. Uh, here, we're actually going to be working on what we call the public index model, which just means that um, we're only trying to hide the message. We're not going to hide this assignment of variables itself. So um, kind of just think of these as being out in the clear. Uh, what I want to do for this talk is to actually focus in on one particular limitation uh, for this type of functional encryption. In particular, um, here the uh, key is going to be a single, not a family, a single formula uh, or circuit. And by um, definition, essentially, this means that um, it will only operate over a fixed size input. This um, formula is only going to look at so many variables and just won't consider anything else. Okay, so in real life, there's uh, many interesting forms of data that are fixed size. Let's say, like filling out a form. Perhaps, uh, if we want to get kind of imaginative, what we could do with the circuit, we could do some kind of cool image processing for a fixed size image. But there's also um, interesting uh, forms of data which aren't like a priori bounded. Let's say, like an arbitrary text, some type of arbitrary text, or perhaps some uh, video that was captured. So, uh, what I want to do in this talk or this work is to initiate the study of uh, functional encryption for arbitrary length inputs. Uh, that, that's the goal. And a, a natural starting point for, for doing this is to study this for uh, regular languages. Uh, really two main features here. Uh, first of all, regular languages I think are good to study since they've um, been well-defined, have been well-defined for a while, and as, actually are also used in many different um, computing applications. Uh, so a language roughly, well, you know, is regular if and only if it's a stri the strings that are accepted in it can be determined by some deterministic finite automata, or DFA. And there's also many different applications, like um, we'd have a search application where we try to match all HTML, HTML matching tags um, by a regular expression. Um, I don't write these things too often. Or a uh, firewall uh, rule that we might want to match um, based on a regular expression for whether we apply some firewall. Uh, firewall um, rule. Okay, so uh, in this talk, I'm going to basically express regular languages through DFAs. So let's uh, take a look at DFAs. I imagine that almost everyone in this audience has, like, you know, come across these at some early point in their computer science education. So I'll try to make this uh, pretty brief. Uh, so DFA will be a, a machine capital M. It will consist of Q, a set of states, um, an alphabet sigma. Uh, a start state Q0, and, and a set of accept states uh, F. Finally, there's uh, also going to be a transition function, which will say, OK, if I'm in this state, and the next symbol on the string you know, is, uh, sig is some uh, sigma, then I'll go, it tells me what the next state to go to is. OK? So just to like, uh, maybe make it a little more concrete, let, let me just kind of throw up a simple example really quickly. Uh, here I try to accept you know, some kind of simple language, like I want to accept all strings, which begin uh, any, any string that begins with a one and has an even parity, okay? So here, um, my start state will be A, and if I get a one, I can go over to B, 
and more ones will toggle back and forth between A and B, where zero will stay either respectively in A or B. And finally, if I end up in uh, the, the bold outline, I'm sure everyone's seen this in like some Sipser uh, te textbook, right? Uh, if, if, any, if, if you end up in C, then, then, you, will, um, then you will accept. Okay, so um, here, for example, the string W1010 will be accepted by this, uh, by this DFA. Okay, so uh, to kind of initiate the study, um, I'm going to do what I call a, a DFA-based um, functional encryption system. And here, the key will be, uh, this uh, key will be associated with the description of a DFA. Um, a ciphertext will, uh, will be associated with uh, uh, a hidden message M, that we're, you know, we're gonna try to hide, and an arbitrary length string, uh, string W, or um, arbitrary length string W. And the semantics that we're gonna want are gonna be pretty analogous to the KPAB, that is, if the machine associated with your DFA um, accepts W, then you should get to learn this message um, small m. If not, you shouldn't be able to learn what the message is. Uh, so basically this is um, uh, that written down. Again, we're gonna be in the public index model where uh, kind of like I, a lot of forms of IB, we're gonna just assume that W is uh, given away in the clear. Okay, so uh, this system, like given the you know, somewhat short amount of time we have here, I won't be able to give everyone a complete picture of how it works. Um, since it has, you could say, many different uh, moving parts. However, um, I'm gonna try to uh, call out what, what I think are a few interesting features to, to, to look at. It hopefully gives um, some intuition of what's going on. In particular, I wanna s give people an idea how the DFA is embedded in the key, how the string's embedded in the ciphertext, and some sense of how decryption follows uh, evaluation of, of the DFA on the string. Uh, so the, the, set, the setting that we're gonna work in is a bilinear group G of prime order P. There's gonna be Q states. So if a key has um, size of Q states, we're gonna pick um, Q random group elements, D sub zero to D sub Q minus one. Uh, a ciphertext will be an L simple string for, for, some not, for, for, for some value L, which will change with the ciphertext. And here when I'm encrypting, I'm gonna pick um, random uh, exponents S zero through S sub L. Now, the interesting uh, part for decryption is decryption is gonna be like an iterative process that follows the execution of the DFA. And if uh, someone over here, well, let's say, was decrypting and I kind of you know, gra grabbed them in the middle of their process and, and looked at what they were doing, what I would find is that they would have computed some intermediate value, uh, uh, E, that's the bilinear map function, of G comma D sub X raised to the S sub J, and that means that when they're decrypting, it, 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 they're able to get this if they're in state X after J symbols. So th th this is, uh, when you're doing this iterative de decryption, th this is, uh, uh, being able to get this represents that, um, this computation on, on the DFA. Okay, and, and to actually realize this, um, to, you know, to build the whole system, um, I, I like to organize it into three different mechanisms. Uh, the first mechanism is what I call um, initialization, which says that, uh, okay, you can get uh, E of D sub zero, where D zero is associated with the start state, to the S zero. Okay, uh, before I see any symbols, I'm in the start state. That, that makes sense. Uh, the next one says, the transition says that if I'm in, if I have this accumulated value, uh, let's say E of G comma DX to SJ, um, and there's a transition on, um, actually should, uh, on state X, and if, uh, let's say, the transition function on state X to W, this should be J, J plus one actually, um, is equal to Y, then I'm able to get this next intermediate value. So that, that's the transition function. Uh, finally, there's gonna be a completion mechanism or, uh, which says that, okay, if I end up in DX, and if I end up uh, in, in a, a sub state at the end, raised to SL, I can take this all the way and actually get the message. So these are really the three parts that I need um, in, in getting the system to go together. Uh, for, for this talk, I'm just gonna focus us in on the parts needed to build this transition mechanism, and hopefully, uh, I, I think that's kind of the most interesting part of, or maybe the most novel part of uh, what's going on here. Okay, so let's, um, let's take a look at at least some pieces of the system. Uh, there's gonna be four algorithms, setup, encrypt, uh, keygen, and uh, decrypt. Uh, the setup algorithm will take as input an alphabet sigma, and here we'll choose a bilinear group um, G of prime order P. Then we'll also choose a random exponent alpha, some other random, some other random group elements, let's not worry too much about them, um, but notice there's a group element per each symbol in the alphabet. And then we'll give most of these away for the public parameters, but the difference is um, we'll only give away E of GG to the alpha for the public parameters, 
and we'll withhold g to the alpha for the um, secret key. Okay, so let's um, take a look at how part of encryption works. Um, the input is gonna be a message small m along with an L, L string, symbol string w. I'm gonna choose these random exponents S0 through S sub L. And now um, the part I wanna show here is that for i is equal to one to L, we give away g to the SI and also h sub wi um, associated with the i symbol to the SI and z to the i minus one. And, uh, so, sorry, z to the S sub i minus one. Uh, so what this, the, kind of the point here is that I am somehow embedding the string w in the ciphertext itself. Um, that, that, that's the point I wanna do here. So I'm getting all these symbols in here and this linking is gonna preserve the order. Like I don't want some attacker to be able to essentially switch the order of, uh, you know, pr permute the order of the string in any way. Um, note, I'm only showing components for the transition mechanism. So if you're wondering like, oh, where's the message play in? Um, this, is, this is why. I'm just sh showing you a little uh, a particular piece of it. Uh, for key generation, it's gonna take as input uh, a message M, the, the alphabet set for the whole system, oh, sorry, it's gonna take a um, DFA, capital M, the alphabet set for the whole system, and we're gonna say um, X, Y, and sigma is in the set uh, T if there's a transition from X to Y on symbol uh, sigma. Again, uh, we're gonna choose, uh, for each state in the system, we're gonna choose a random group element and also choose a random exponent for each uh, transition. Now the part I want to get across here is that, um, let's see, is that there is again, we are embedding somehow this transition from X to Y on symbol sigma in the keys. Like we have this D sub X inverse uh, and this D sub Y and H sigma to the R sub T. So the, of course um, there's not enough time to make complete sense of this, but I just want to give people a sense that, you know, it, it is, you know, we are embedding this DFA in there somehow. Okay, so let's see how the transi this transition mechanism actually um, co comes together, which is gonna be part of decryption. Okay, so let's suppose that the ith symbol um, is equal to sigma, and I wanna, I'm gonna wanna, I'm gonna wanna go from um, some representation of being on, uh, let's say, state x after i minus one symbols to state y after i symbols. Well, I can grab some pieces from the keys in the ciphertext, and if I plug things in, um, the second line is I get what looks maybe like a, a perhaps a somewhat complicated formula, but uh, one feature I'll point out here is that for this, a bunch of things cancel out and we get something uh, simpler. Uh, a key feature here is that this W sub I uh, here has to match H sub sigma or else uh, things won't cancel out in the right way. Uh, so what I get is, you know, if you actually follow the math, which, you know, you, you can, probably do um, offline a little bit more, uh, you, you, can, uh, you can see that this, this value I end up with is exactly what allows me to transition from here to here. I just multiply this by this, you know, these things cancel out, and now I've taken the next iteration in decryption. I've actually um, taken, taken this, step, um, this step forward. So really most of the decryption is just uh, repeating this transition, you know, you have to get started. Okay, I won't show that, but once you get there, you just repeat this mechanism over and over again, and you, 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 you know, you get hopefully to the end where um, you're hopefully in an accept state, and then you do this final completion mechanism that finishes things off. Uh, so really, um, really, what, what, what the, the system up here is following the execution of the DFA. Okay, so um, I'd like to, you know, of course, uh, like summarize up here, um, of course, uh, to get more details, uh, we'll have to look a little closer at the paper offline. But the main um, point here that I wanna summarize is that um, the grand goal is to start looking at, or the, the goal for this work was to start looking at uh, functional encryption for arbitrary length inputs. Uh, I think you know, we took the first step by looking at it for regular languages or DFAs. Uh, I'd like to leave this talk with um, putting out three problems which I think are uh, pretty challenging, and you know, I'd be pleasantly surprised to see a solution to them in the near future, but I think they're good to you know, really put down and identify. Uh, the first one is can we support, um, instead of DFAs, can we support NFAs inherently? Well, NFAs and DFAs uh, you know, accept, decide the same set of languages, but there can be regular expressions and NFAs that have compact representations, but if you try to like, give them as a DFA, it's gonna combinatorially explode. So it'd be good to be able to do this, let's say, natively as an, as an NFA. 
Uh, the, the, uh, unfortunately, I think there's, th this is kind of like similar, analogous to the problem of like being able to do formulas in AB and not do circuits. So I think this, I think this might be a little bit tricky. Uh, the next very natural thing to do is can we climb the Chomsky hierarchy, right? Um, right now we can do this for regular languages. Uh, why not context free? Why not context set? Well, I, I kind of know why not, but uh, you know, we like to, we like to pu push it, we like to push it forward. Like we like to be able to do more and more. Or another way of looking at it is, you know, I can embed things for a DFA. Uh, obviously, I like to do it for a Turing machine instead. I mean, that would be obviously m more powerful. Uh, again, I, I think this would be uh, pretty, pretty challenging. Uh, finally, uh, just one kind of last note, uh, I talked about working in the public index model, and this is an open problem for this arbitrary length or the, or the fixed length, like, a, like um, the circuit or the formulas also. Um, we like to be able to, you know, right now I'm just saying, okay, we're gonna have to give out W in the clear. Be even better if we could uh, somehow do some oblivious evaluation and also hide it. Uh, again, I think that's probably a pretty challenging problem. Okay, uh, thank you very much.